We're in the middle of the series called Six Ways to Wreck Your Life. And uh, Dan did a great job kicking the series off, and our buddy Daryl Reed from D.C. Regional Church came up from Washington, D.C. to, to speak last week. And today, uh, I'm good to continue the series here. And I just want to say that um, I really believe that um, everyone is here today for a reason. There's something in the Scripture verse for everyone here today. Whether you're single, whether you're married, uh, whether you're divorced, whether you're in the middle of this situation we're going to talk about, or you're coming, you're coming out of it, there's something here this morning. So I just want to pray that God really speaks to all of us, and we hear what, what He wants us to hear, okay? Let's bow our heads, let's pray. God, we're thankful for the truth of Scripture. We're thankful this light that uh, uh, pierces the darkness and shows the way in a very ambivalent culture how we're to live, how we're to live for you, and how we're to live so that we can have the abundant life that that you talk about. And uh, we pray that you would help us to see that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, he could have stopped it, but he didn't. He knew he could have stopped it at any point, but he didn't. He was too far in. King David was the most powerful man in the ancient Near East, and one day he was up on the roof, and he saw below in the distance a beautiful woman bathing And he sent for her, and he slept with her, and he thought he was done with her until he received a handwritten note with two words, I'm pregnant. Well, David wasn't stupid. He was the king. He was, people considered him a god. He moved fast to cover his tracks. He told his general Joab to put Bathsheba's husband Uriah in the front line when they were in battle, and then to withdraw, leaving him exposed to the oncoming warriors. And that's exactly what they did, and Uriah was killed. This week I sat down and I made a list of almost every single person I've ever known who has gotten into an affair. And I got to the point where I eventually had to stop writing because I was so overcome with sadness because of everyone affected by this situation. I was sad for two reasons. Number one, because there were so many. And number two, because they could have been prevented Every single situation, every single time that someone found themselves getting into this particular area of trouble, it could have been prevented. And so today, we're, we're continuing our series, Six Easy Ways to Wreck Your Life, and what I'm, we're going to do is we're going to open up the life of David so we can learn from his mistakes, not only that we can prevent an affair, but we can prevent an affair from happening again. And this is huge, even for those of you that are in junior high and high school, as you're here today and you're like, you know what? I, 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 what in the world does this have to do with me? Um, or those of you who have gone through affairs, and you're like, honestly, I could have stayed at Ocean City. Um, there is something you need to hear out of this passage. Let's look at it. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says that in the springtime, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men. Underline that phrase. David had 30 mighty men that surrounded him, his royal guard, people that have proven themselves in battle. So in the springtime, when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army out into battle. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. And underline the next phrase, but David remained in Jerusalem. And David's mighty men were pretty cool guys. 2 Samuel tells us that Josheb Bashabeth, a Tekamite, I know many of you who are expecting, you're like, what are we going to call if it's a boy? Perfect name right there. <laughs> he raised his spear against 800 men who he killed in one encounter. Killed 800 men at a time. That's the guy you want next to you if you're a king. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahoi, another awesome name. He was with David when the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. His hand atrophied on the sword because he killed so many people in battle to defend David. Next to him was Shema. When the Philistines banded together, Israel's troops fled from him, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck down the Philistines. And during harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. 
David longed for water, and he said out loud, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. Well, three of the mighty warriors said, Okay. Broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their own lives to get this from me? David surrounded himself with these guys who were willing to die with him. And that's why I don't think it's coincidence that when David committed adultery, these guys were not around. Verse 1 again tells us that David sent Joab out with the king's men, but David stayed in Jerusalem. And this is the first ingredient in every affair. It's a lack of accountability. Let me ask you a question. Who knows the true condition of your soul right now? Like, who knows the real stuff, the dark stuff, the painful stuff, your thoughts that you're embarrassed about, that sort of thing? There was a recent Reader Digest poll that revealed 50% of all husbands and 35% of all wives have committed adultery. And I'm like, honestly, I don't trust any of those statistics. But what I do know from experience is that a lot of people have done this. Now, many of you are saying, why did I even come here today? Because your spouse has gone through this or you have gone through this and you're like, seriously, we could be at the shore right now and instead of feeling bad and having all of these memories and guilt thrown up, and I just want to say, if you've confessed your sin to God, He has forgiven you completely and you need to forgive yourself and now we're focusing on the future. The Bible shows us that people who have affairs do so because they have not established boundaries. Now, let me show you this. Uh, Dr. Jay Lindsay is a psychologist in Boulder, Colorado. So many people, when we talk about fairs, it was like, oh, it was like an instantaneous one-time attraction. I was completely mowed over with emotion, and I was so tired, and it was just a moment of weakness where there was instantaneous attraction, and then bam, it happened. Dr. Lindsay says that's rarely how that happens. Usually there's a 12-step process. There's readiness. There's alertness. There's an innocent meeting, which is followed by an intentional meeting, and then public lingering. You're at a school function, and you see, each, so you see someone you're attracted to, and you're kind of talking, but nothing really is coming of it. There's public lingering, private lingering, and then a purposeful isolation. There's a pre-planned meeting where you need to get together for legitimate reasons, and it just so happens to be with someone that you're into. Pleasurable isolation followed by an embrace, followed by a passionate embrace, followed by capitulation, actually having sex. And then you accept it. You start rationalizing. Now, he lists 12 steps, but when you really boil it down to, there's one problem. Accountability. You're able to progress through all of those steps because there isn't someone around to look at you and say, hey, wait a minute. I recognize something here that's not healthy. A friend, relative, coworker, whatever, that looks at you and tells you the truth. Um, many of you don't know that when we lived in Ohio, we started a church there, and when we left, the pastor that was recruited to come in behind us had an affair. Actually had an affair with my daughter's dance instructor. When I found out, I wanted to drive back to Ohio and beat the crap out of him. I felt violated. I was so ticked off at this guy. Well, I found out in the process that soon after coming, he threw out what I had instituted, accountability questions that we asked together with a group of men. Have you spent time in God's Word? Have you t spent time with your spouse and family? Have you spent any time viewing pornography? Have you spent any time with a person other than your spouse that's inappropriate? Have you mishandled finances? Have you just lied to me? And so my question to you is, who asked you questions like that? Who's, when was the last time someone looked you in the eye and started asking you very pointed questions where they knew you were going to lie to them? Who is it in your life that you have that can ask those questions? See, most people are under the impression that bad people have affairs. Bad people don't have affairs. Really great, awesome people have affairs. Normal people without accountability have affairs. I think there are three things people, we need to ask other people to hold us accountable for. One is time. Someone needs to know where you and I are at all times. 
There is never a time you say, you know what, I'm just going to blow off steam. I'll be back later. Really? Where are you going? Who are you going to see? It's not just kids that need to be accountable for their times. Everyone needs to be accountable for their time. The second thing that we need to ask other people to hold us accountable for, communication devices, email accounts, cell phone passwords, voicemail passwords, computers. My wife has password and access to every single thing that I have. How about you? Is there a secret place where you can communicate with someone else? Is your voicemail open? If you pulled out, do you quickly delete text messages because you were flirting with someone? Someone needs to have access to that phone and say, dude, seriously? Don't say, dude, seriously, because then they'll make fun of you. And the tech team will actually create videos of, videos of you doing, dude, seriously. And anyway, so, all right. So don't say, dude, seriously. But have someone who is accountable that can look at your phone that has access to all of your stuff. And you're like, that's crazy. No one does that. That's why affairs happen. Martin Luther, and the third thing you need to have someone hold you accountable for is your feelings. See, Martin Luther said, you can, you can stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can't keep them, or you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And, um, wow, that's an ugly picture of him. Wow, that's... Um, but the, the point is, is that you can't help who you're attracted to. Would you agree? Yes or no? Yes or no? Who thinks that you can control who you're attracted to? We got one person. All right? Everybody thinks you can't help it. Why? Because you see someone and you find them attractive or you don't. And here's the thing. That doesn't change once you get married. You will still find people attractive. That's normal. Why? Because they're attractive. You look at me, and I know how you look at me. <laughs> and let me just say, quite frankly, it's a little weird, okay? So stop that. But you know what I'm saying? You're married. It's not like you're dead. And it's normal that you're going to notice people that are attractive or you normally in other circumstances you would be attracted to. But you've made a covenant promise for life to one person before God and before other people. And so because of that, those people that you normally would be attracted, attracted to, you're going to stop it right there. You're going to stop it at step one. You're not going to go to two, you're not going to go to three, you're not going to go to four, number five. And why? Because you're going to have other people around you that are going to look at you and say, hold on, you know you're a little flirty back there. What? What? What do you mean? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> people that trust you and love you and are going to hold you accountable. Why? Because you're normal. Not bad people don't get in affairs. Good people that don't have accountability that get, in, get into an affair. My wife tells me I always love to tell this story, and uh, she makes fun of me when I do it. Um, I had, um, when, when the church started, I, I was, every weekend I was flying somewhere. And there was one particular time I was doing a whole speaking thing in the Southwest, and I was going through New Mexico, and it landed the very last time I spoke was in sunny night in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Have you ever been there? There's nothing there. Don't go. And so I'm in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I have just spoken everywhere. I'm completely tired. And now before I left, I asked a good friend of mine who's a prayer partner and accountability partner, I want you to pray for me because I want to use this time wisely. I want to be able to pray. I, want to, I don't want to overeat and just sit in front of the television, just veg and that sort of thing. I'm going to use this time productively to, that to, there isn't a temptation that comes my way that I'm not able to with. I mean, I go on and on and on through this whole list. He was like, okay, I'm going to pray for you. So I go on the speaking thing, and I end up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where no one knows me. Not a soul. It's before the days where the internet was big. No one, there was no social media. No one would have found out. About 10 o'clock, I tell myself, I'm hungry. I have a hankering for some Krispy Kreme donuts. 
So I'm like, I'm going to go cross the street, see if they have Krispy Kreme. So I go across the street, or I, I open up the door, and I start walking down the hallway, and this beautiful woman opens up the door. And I look at her, and I'm like, I tell myself, you know what? I really want some Krispy Kremes right now. And I start walking. I mean, it didn't even phase me. No one knew where I was. I was completely outside of anybody that would ever found out. And I really attribute the, the strength of that to two things. Number one, trying to the best of my ability to practice the art of what Job says, I, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not lust after a woman. So every single time you do that, it, it, you develop a little more resolve and a little more resolve and a little more resolve. And also to the prayers and accountability, I knew I was going to stand in front of my friend when I got back. My dad tells me uh, when I was, started traveling a lot, he started telling me, I asked him, I was like, there's this whole subculture of traveling where people hook up. I had no idea. Those of you who are in business and you know exactly what it is, when you're traveling on planes and you're going through hotels and that sort of thing, I was like, Dad, you spent your whole life traveling. How did you stand up to that sort of pressure and temptation? And he said, son, it was all about good habits. Good habits. You never, ever go down to the bar. People, that own, people go down to the bar for one reason and one reason only. I always order dinner and brought it up to my room. I never do that in a hotel. Anyway. That's the first thing, lack of accountability. Um, the second ingredient is found is in verse 2. It says, One evening, and notice it was the evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. My question for David is not, how could you let the affair happen? But how could you let yourself up on the roof? If he wasn't up on the roof where he knew he had the ability and the vantage point to look down into people's windows, he never would have gotten into that affair. That shows us the second ingredient in all affairs. It's lack of clear boundaries. Every affair I've ever witnessed, in every single one, the person did not set up and maintain clear boundaries about the way they interacted with the opposite sex. Now, our staff, we have very clear boundaries written in our staff policy manual. We're never alone with the opposite sex outside of the office. I never meet someone for a lunch appointment. You know, you come into the office. No, we'll meet. I'm sorry. I, that, I know that gives me the ability to meet with a man for lunch and not a woman. That way I'll, I'll meet in the office for lunch with a woman. But I'll never do it outside alone. I'll never counsel someone of the opposite sex with the door closed. That's why if you come to our office, we have these big old windows like, this is big windows. Yep. No long-term counseling. We've mastered the art of the side hug. Yo, what's up? <laughs> I mean, there are times you'll hug someone, and it's not inappropriate, but by and large, you, you want to try to master the art of the side hug. My question I want to ask you is, do you have clear boundaries for how you interact with the opposite sex, particularly if you're married? Like, have you communicated as a couple this is the way we are. We are not going to interact with people of the opposite sex. One clear boundary is to never, ever, ever talk about your marriage problems with someone other than your spouse, a counselor, or a close friend of the same sex. You do that, it is a powder keg that you're lighting. It will be over. People say, you're crazy. I don't need those kind of boundaries. And I would say, don't give the devil a foothold, the Apostle Paul says. Now, some of you don't have that kind of a network, and you're like, okay, I'd like to do that. And that's why we have groups here at our church, men's groups, women's group, couples groups, singles, mixed, every way, every variety. But we need to all have a group of people that we know and we trust who are going to look us in the eye and hold us accountable. Here's the third, thing, third ingredient. 2 Samuel 11.3 says, And David sent someone to find out about her, and the man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. We're not sure how much time elapsed between the first time he saw her on the roof, like, oh my gosh, she's freaking hot, and the time that he slept with her. But sometime between she's hot and he slept with her, in between there was a whole lot of rationalization going on. And that's the third thing 
in every affair, rationalizing, making excuses for the kind of behaviors. Now, every person I've ever known that's gotten into an affair has spent an incredible amount of energy rationalizing every single step of the affair and justifying it. David was like, uh, I'm just curious. Maybe I'll send someone to find out who she is because I want to welcome her to the neighborhood. <laughs> she looks lonely. Her husband isn't here. My wife isn't here. I'm going to come for her. I'm the king. In the ancient Near East, every king has a concubine. I deserve this. Now, here's a list of real excuses I've heard from people who've had affairs. My spouse wasn't meeting my needs. I'm not attracted to my spouse anymore. I was sick of not having sex. Nobody's perfect. My marriage was going to end anyway. I had a weak moment. I was under so much stress at work. We drifted. We never meant for it to happen. God will forgive me and the ever popular, I'm only human. What I want to do is I want you to pull out a pen and a piece of paper. I want you to write down a theological phrase that when you get to the point where you start wanting to rationalize, I want you to be able to draw upon this, this phrase. I'll, I'll, st- I'll have you write it down in English, and then we'll look at it in Greek and Hebrew. Are you ready? Two words. When you're rationalizing, when you're rationalizing and justifying steps in an affair, you want to call to mind this very deep theological phrase, two words, bull crap. <laughs> All right, from the original Greek, bull crapus. It's, it's in there, right? Please, let's call it what it is. You didn't have an affair because your spouse wasn't meeting your needs. You had an affair because you're lazy and selfish. And the sooner you begin telling yourself the truth, the sooner you're going to find the first step to healing. The good news is, is that God loves helping lazy and selfish people get their lives back together. If that weren't so, none of us in this room would have any hope. Having an affair may not be your particular sin, but you and I all have our sins. And none of them are any better or worse than having an affair. That's why we're looking at King David not to feel bad, but to remind us how to get our lives back together because David was still a man after God's own heart. He turns around and composes Psalm 51. I've blown it, God. I have a contrite heart. Please don't withdraw your spirit from me. And he goes on and on and on, confessing his sin. I told you I made a long list of people who had affairs. What I didn't tell you, I also have a long list of people who had affairs and got their marriages back together, many even stronger than before. And so I just want to say, if you or your spouse have gone through that, you can make it. God's grace is big enough for you all the time. You can count on it. Let's pray. We're thankful, God, for the truth of your word and the light that it provides us in the darkness and the hope and healing and the forgiveness that it points to in Jesus. God, not a person here is perfect. All of us have sinned. And for those who have had this be their particular ditch that they've fallen in. We pray for an extra measure of grace and truth to come into that situation. We pray for repentance. We also pray for healing, and we know that you'll do those things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.